Rejoice, Episode 49, Holy Heresy. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Now, in this week's text, we need a little overlap, just some of last week. We do need it, I assure you. Here's last week's symbol of the apostles in the Mass for Pope Marcellus. The voices blended, singing alone loud in affirmation. And behind their chant, the vigilant angel of the church militant disarmed and menaced her heresiarchs. If you remember, I overlapped last week as well. That's the end of last week's piece. Here's the new text. A horde of heresies fleeing with mitres awry. Photius and the brood of mockers, of whom Mulligan was one, and Arius, warring his life long upon the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father, and Valentine, spurning Christ's terrene body, and the subtle African heresiarch Sabellius, who held that the Father was himself his own son, words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in mockery to the stranger, idle mockery. End of quote. Now, I'm sure you recall the Pope Marcellus reference last week, how Joyce loved the Italian composer Palestrina, who composed the Mass for Pope Marcellus, one of the shortest-term popes in Catholic history. Three weeks he ruled. Here we now go into the full flight of Stephen's fantasy. The vigilant angel of the church militant disarmed and menaced her heresiarchs. Well, that's Michael the fierce archangel who guards the church against her enemies, who routs the heretics. Actually, Michael is a very interesting guy. He's never seen without a sword or some weapon in his hand. He's to be found everywhere there's any trace of Christianity. And he's also in the Judaic faith and in Islam. Michael got around. The chant, by the way, from the apostles, I don't know if I mentioned this, I think I did. Part of Palestrina's mass features the apostles big time and individually. And as their voices are raised, on comes Michael to repel all borders. In this case, heresiarchs. Isn't that a great word, heresiarch? A heresiarch is, in fact, the arch-heretic, the founder of a heresy. The original Greek word meant to take or to choose. But sure enough, Stephen now imagines a whole cluster of heresy founders retreating in disarray. As Michael moves in on them, they're fleeing with mitres awry, the mitre, of course, being a bishop's pointed hat. And now Joyce, or Stephen rather, names the heretics, and they are Photius, Arius, Valentine, and Sibelius. And this is who they were, and this gives you some idea of the range and depth of Joyce's scope in this novel, as if you hadn't already got that. First, Photius. He was the 9th century bishop of Constantinople, the patriarch, in fact, who, because of massive controversy, was in and out of the church like a fiddler's elbow. And what was his heresy? To simplify it greatly, he attacked the traditional concept of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he also, therefore, and thereby, provoked a schism between Rome and Constantinople. In Rome, he's a villain, but to the Eastern Rite, the Orthodox Church, he's Saint Photius the Great. Note the remark, by the way, Photius and the brood of mockers, of whom Mulligan was one. Because if you remember... Mulligan has already made mocking remarks about Hamlet and fathers and sons. Now, be aware, we're beginning to surf a little tide here, the same tide we saw earlier of father and son stuff. It's a major, major theme of Ulysses. Arius is next. He was a bishop from Egypt, and his heyday was around 300 Anno Domini, and he was the promulgator of the famous Arian heresy which also challenged the Trinity by saying that God the Father came first and that long afterward he created Jesus Christ, God the Son, and that therefore the Son was inferior to the Father. But that's in conflict with the Roman Church teaching, which says Father, Son, and Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, three divine persons equal in one. And that Arian non-Trinitarianism put down quite a deep root, but so touchy was the Catholic Church about it, and about the Arian heresy, that I was taught it in school, in a small Irish town, in the 1950s. Can you imagine? And you can bet your boots that the Jesuits majored on these heretics when Joyce was going to school. Valentine, the third heretic he mentioned, he was best known as Valentinus. And he materialized within a century almost of Christ's death, and he preached in Rome around 150 AD. But it was what he preached that caused the problem. Because Valentine was agnostic, Not agnostic, he was G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Drop the A at the beginning from agnostic. From the word gnosis, 
which is the Greek word for basically holy knowledge. And Gnosticism was a mixum gatherum of faith taken from a menu of ancient beliefs right across the board, including Judaism. And this kind of impurity got Gnosticism condemned as heresy because the church was desperate to maintain unity. The one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, remember? Valentine also claimed that Christ was only a spirit, never became man, never had an earthly human being. Well, that didn't take his case forward too far or too fruitfully. So who's left? We have Photius, Arius, Valentine. Oh, yes, Sibelius. Sibelius, now, he was also early, two centuries after Christ, and his heresy was to preach that the names Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, were just three ways of naming one entity, God the Father. Three ways of saying the same thing. So, all four heretics, or heresiarchs, if you prefer, named by Joyce as flowing through Stephen's mind, they're all note in the same Father and Son territory. And because this piece is so complex, let me quote again the original text that relates to them. Photius and the brood of mockers, of whom Mulligan was one, and Arius, warring his life long upon the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father, and Valentine, spurning Christ's terrene body, and the subtle African heresiarch Sabellius, who held that the Father was himself his own son, words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in mockery to the stranger. Idle mockery. End of quote. Woo-hoo. Well, next week is a little simpler. Did I hear somebody murmur? Thank the Lord, whoever he is. Rejoice, episode 50, Weaving the Wind. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Here's my next passage from near the end of chapter one of Ulysses. It's a follow-on from Stephen's random thoughts of the heretics of the Catholic Church. His mind has been wandering in that direction since Haynes the Englishman began the conversation that led to Stephen saying he, Stephen, served the Church of Rome and the Crown of England. We're still in Stephen's thoughts. Here we go. The void awaits surely all them that weave the wind, a menace, a disarming, and a worsting from those embattled angels of the church, Michael's host, who defend her ever in the hour of conflict with their lances and their shields. Hear, hear! Prolonged applause! Zut! Nom de Dieu! End of quote. And that's where Stephen's thought ends, just there, for the moment. The void awaits surely all them that weave the wind. Well, of course, the void is the eternal damnation that awaits those who conspire against Mother Church, who weave against her, weave conspiracies. But does he mean all heretical, that is to say, undermining untrustworthies, such as Mulligan? By the way, can I share with you a fascinating cross-reference? It may just be that most appealing of things, a sting of zeitgeist, and it's this. Joyce was working on Ulysses for several years, and it published, as you probably know, in 1922. In 1920... Some years after Joyce had written but not yet published the opening chapters, the great modernist poet T.S. Eliot, who visited Joyce in Paris in August 1920, produced a volume of verse called Garantion, themed around age and men. And in there is this line, and I quote, Vacant shuttles weave the wind. I have no ghosts, an old man in a drafty house. Now think of Joyce's line, but who are all them that weave the wind. Coincidence? Almost certainly. (laughs) Yeah, but there is another reference in the Eliot poem, to which I'll come in a moment. And you may say that I'm barking up a blind alley, and that's fine, because there's no evidence that I can find to suggest that Eliot could have read the opening chapter of Ulysses in time to make reference to it in his own work, which was published in 1920. And anyway, the reference is elsewhere. There's a play by Shakespeare's wild man contemporary, John Webster. And it has a similar reference to the weaving of conspiracies. And just to... (laughs) I like this. Just to gin up a little Joycean possibility in terms of weaving, Joyce's great patron's name was Harriet Shaw Weaver. (laughs) However, let's move on and be serious. To the end of that quote I gave you earlier, I'll repeat it. Those embattled angels of the church, Michael's host, who defend her ever in the hour of conflict with their lances and their shields. Here, here! Prolonged applause! Zut! Nom de Dieu! Well, that's straightforward enough. Michael was the archangel who defended the church against heretics and heresies. You know that from last week. And zut! Nom de Dieu! Are exclamations from colloquial French. Sort of, damn it! And name of God! Now, though, huh, comes the other curious reference that could have involved T.S. Eliot. 
I wouldn't have taken any notice of this had I not recently been reading Eliot and found the two references so close to each other. From the text of Ulysses, this is the continuation of the scene between Haynes the Englishman and Stephen as they stand on the cliff top near the Martello Pitar. Quote, Of course, I'm a Britisher, Haynes' voice said, and I feel as one. I don't want to see my country fall into the hands of German Jews either. That's our national problem, I'm afraid, just now. Right? End of quote. End of Ulysses quote. Here's another quote from the beginning of Eliot's Garantion. My house is a decayed house, and the Jew squats on the windowsill. End of quote. Okay, so let's suppose it's nothing stronger than a coincidence, and Eliot was anti-Semitic and Joyce wasn't. But it's odd, isn't it? Not only that, if you read on in the Garantian collection, you'll find abundant reference to the very same ground that Joyce was traversing, with references to the Odyssey and boats and boatmen. However, I want to get off this dicey topic, so here's the next quotation from Ulysses for this week. Quote, Two men stood at the verge of the cliff, watching. Businessman, boatman. She's making for Bullock Harbour. The boatman nodded towards the north of the bay with some disdain. There's five fathoms out there, he said. It'll be swept up that way when the tide comes in about one. It's nine days today. The man that was drowned. A sail veering about the blank bay, waiting for a swollen bundle to bob up, roll over to the sun, a puffy face. Salt white. Here I am. End of quote. And this is not too difficult or obscure a passage, so here it goes. Stephen, standing beside Haynes, sees, and we are allowed to believe, overhears two local men discussing a drowning, and he thinks about it. They're watching a boat making for that sweet little bay at Bullock Harbour, south of Sandy Cove, and they're figuring that it's 30 feet deep out there, and it's now the ninth day since the reported drowning. The tide will come in at one o'clock, one o'clock that day. And by the way, if you check the tide records for June the 16th, 1904, that will be spot on accurate. And the lore about drowning is, I remember this as a child, I'm not sure if it's that scientific a theory, that after nine days a body comes to the surface. And maybe the people in the boat out there will look over the side and see the swollen bundle, this is Stephen thinking, bobbing up, rolling over to see the sun, and they'll see the puffy, salt-white face that looks as though it's saying cheerfully, here I am. By the way, don't you love the little sting from Shakespeare there? The quote from Ariel, Prospero's spirit servant in the Tempest, who sings, Full fathom five, thy father lies. And the two men, the businessman and the boatman, and indeed Stephen and Haynes, are looking at an island. And in actual fact, on the old maritime maps of Dublin Bay, there is a line that says, the five fathom line. Last word for this week. You know, I can't get that idea of a connection between Joyce's Ulysses and Eliot's Garantian out of my head. It does feel, in fleeting moments, as though Eliot must have read those early chapters of Ulysses. But I'm sure it's my imagination at work. And by the way, Dylan Thomas was the one who pointed out that T.S. Eliot's name was an anagram for toilets. See you next week. Rejoice, episode 51, A Little Exposure. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Here's the next passage from near the end of chapter one of Ulysses. Quote, they followed the winding path down to the creek. Buck Mulligan stood on a stone in shirt sleeves, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. A young man, clinging to a spur of rock near him, moved slowly frogwise, his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. Is the brother with your Maliki? Down in Westmeath with the Bannons. Still there. I got a card from Bannon. Says he found a sweet young thing down there. Fought a girl he calls her. A snapshot, eh? Brief exposure. Buck Mulligan sat down to unlace his boots. An elderly man shot up near the spur of rock, a blowing red face. He scrambled up by the stones, water glistening on his pate and on its garland of grey hair, water rilling over his chest and paunch, and spilling jets out of his black, sagging loincloth. Buck Mulligan made way for him to scramble past, and, glancing at Haynes and Stephen, crossed himself piously with his thumbnail and brow and lips and breast bone. End of quote. Okay, quite a short passage this week, but contrary to what you might think from a surface glance, there's a lot to say. All three men have left the Martello Tower, and Haynes the Englishman and Stephen Didylus 
are strolling along behind Buck Mulligan, who has gone on ahead to prepare for his swim in the natural bathing place, known to this day and frequented as in Joyce's time as the Forty Foot in Sandy Cove. After some dawdling and delaying and looking out to sea and discussing all kinds of theological notions and political tangents, the two men, Haynes and Stephen, get to the Forty Foot. Have a look again at that first sentence, just for the sake of descriptive writing. Quote, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. Rippling. Can't you just see it? And of course, rippling beside the water. That's just instinctive, that kind of writing. And Ulysses is full of that kind of tiny diamond. And look at the next sentence. A young man clinging to a spur of rock near him moved slowly frogwise his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. Not only do we get the entire visual, including the transformation of color of the legs by the water, think of a deeper meaning. Do we not see man in the primordial ooze of the deep jelly? Ever seen frog jelly, which contains all the little black dots of tadpoles? And now we have some dialogue. The young man asks Mulligan, Is the brother with you, Maliki? And Mulligan replies that his brother is down to Westmead with the Bannons. Buck Mulligan's brother has a student acquaintance named Alec Bannon. He's a very minor character in Ulysses. And his family lived down in Westmeath, an hour or more in today's terms, west northwest of Dublin. Now, something really interesting begins to happen. The young man with the frog's legs speaks from the water to Mulligan, and he says that he got a postcard from Alec Bannon, and the postcard says that Bannon found a sweet young thing down there. Photo girl, he calls her. Among the many criticisms levelled at Joyce down the years has been the notion that he wasn't really a novelist, that he was a kind of prose poet who didn't understand the practical cogs and spring wheels of novel writing. That, of course, is nonsense. He understood them perfectly, a great deal better than most novelists who were ever born. And here's just a tiny ray of proof, because here Joyce is foreshadowing something. The sweet young thing... Down in Westmeath is none other than Millie, the daughter of Mr. Leopold Bloom, whom we shall soon meet, and through whom we shall learn that Millie has a job as a photographer's assistant in Mullingar, the largest town in County Westmeath. Remember some time ago I pointed out to you that Mr. Bloom and Stephen see the same cloud or will on the same day? Well, in his novelist's brain, Joyce is carrying the entire narrative where everyone is, who everyone is, what they're doing, and so on, as a novelist has to do. This Millie Bloom reference is a perfect example, a little exposure to what's to come. And when we get there, we say, Ah, I see. And we are drawn farther in, which is the true novelist's intention. By the way, here's a truly fascinating sidebar. When Joyce was 18, he spent a summer in the town of Mullingar, which indeed did have a photographic shop. And while he was there, he wrote a play. It was called A Brilliant Career. It hasn't survived, but the dedication has. He wrote, To my own soul, I dedicate the first true work of my life. He never dedicated anything else that he ever wrote to anyone. Last references from this week. The elderly man who, quote, shot up near the spur of rock a blowing red face, unquote, was almost certainly a priest. How do we know? The black, sagging loincloth for a start. That was typical bathing garb for a priest who found himself among other but naked men. His garland of grey hair, as Joyce suggested, describes the tonsure haircut of the church, originally designed to emulate Christ's crown of thorns. And we are made certain of the fact by the mocker Mulligan, who, behind the priest's back, glances, mischievously, we presume, at Haynes and Stephen, and then mocking again, cr quote, crossed himself piously with his thumbnail at brow and lips and breastbone, unquote. Exactly the same as priests do, saying Mass. Nothing new in that attitude from Buck Mulligan. Be here next week. Rejoice. Episode 52. A Side of Ribs. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Here's my next to last, the penultimate segment from near the end of chapter one of Ulysses. And by the way, there's a really terrific moment later on in this, at the very end. 
They're all foregathered at the 40-foot bathing place in Sandy Cove, just down from the Martello Tower, and Mulligan is taking off his clothes to go swimming. Neither Stephen Dedalus nor Haynes the Englishman will join him. Mulligan is being chatted to by a young acquaintance already in the water who's hanging on to a spur of rock and nattering away, and here's the first of this week's two passages, and I quote, uh, Seymour's back in town, the young man said, grasping again his spur of rock. Chucked medicine and gone in for the army. I go to God, Buck Mulligan said. Gone over next week to stew. You know that red Carlisle girl, Lily? Yes. Spooning with him last night on the pier. The father is rotto with money. Is she up the pole? I better ask Seymour that. Seymour a bleeding officer. Buck Mulligan said. He nodded to himself as he drew off his trousers and stood up, saying tritely, Red-headed women buck like goats. End of quote. <laughs> okay. Remember Seymour? Yes, you do. He's the young man to whom Mulligan referred as one who would help start an initiation rite, like the hazing Clive Kempthorpe. These are all names only in Ulysses. Like the hazing Clive Kempthorpe received at an Oxford college, having his bags, his pants cut from him, and his shirt tails flapping. Well, apparently, Seymour is back in Dublin. He has quit being a medical student, and he's about to study to stew, so that he can sit an examination for a commission as an officer in the British Army. And the boys, as students will do, now chat about the girl Seymour may be dating, a red-haired girl named of Lily Carlyle. He was seen kissing her the previous night, and it seems that young Seymour may be after a girl with a rich daddy. Mulligan wonders aloud at the very idea of Seymour being an officer, and he then gives a sweeping, generalized opinion of the erotic tendencies and capacities of women with red hair. I, personally, wouldn't depend upon his accuracy. And note the expletive of wonder and amazement. Ah, go to God! It was in common use when I was a child, and there were many variations, including today's up-to-date, no way, or shut up, though in my day it was something like, get up the yard, or in polite company, well, bless my soul. That's what a go to God is. Here's the next passage from the text, and it stars Mulligan again, and it has something delicious in it beneath the surface, as I promised you. Here's the quote. He, that's Mulligan, he broke off in alarm, feeling his side under his flapping shirt. My twelfth rib is gone, he cried. I'm the Ubermensch, toothless kinch and I, the Superman. He struggled out of his shirt and flung it behind him to where his clothes lay. Are you going in here, Malachy? Yes, make room in the bed. End of quote. Well, once a blasphemer, always a blasphemer. Now, Mulligan is attacking the anti-religionist ideas of Nietzsche, whose Ubermensch, the upper man, literally, the superman, in a corny literal translation, is meant to demonstrate, and this is the crudest of shorthand of giving you here, that the man who depends upon himself is above all those who require a religious belief, because he thinks for himself. It was a topic much debated at the turn of the 19th century in the early 20th. Toothless Kinch is a double dig at Stephen. As we'll find out, Stephen has poor capacity for self-assertion and poor teeth, some of which are rotting. And, of course, this is also drawing the teeth of Kinch, the wit as sharp as a blade, and, indeed, Kinch itself. Mulligan's nickname for Stephen is also double-edged. Mulligan says he means it because of its sharp sound, like a blade. But he also knew that a Kinch was the slang term for the child of a prostitute. Shakespeare used a different term, thou whore son. So, now standing there, getting ready to swim and stripped off, Mulligan feels under his ribs, and he declares there's a rib missing. And here, Joyce is alluding opaquely to an old superstition, inaccurate but common, the belief that all men lack one rib ever since God took a rib out of Adam's side to make Eve. And that opacity connects the Ubermensch to Adam, because when Nietzsche had Zarathustra thus spake of the Ubermensch, he claimed that when the Ubermensch took his rightful place in the future, and there would be no more men, no more ordinary men, the last man standing would therefore be the most reviled thing on earth. And so Mulligan is carefully and shrewdly aligning himself with the first man, Adam. That was essentially the core of the Zarathustra debate around the time that Joyce went to university in the year 1900 or thereabouts. There were big debates about it in Oxford and Cambridge. Confused? 
You might be, but there's no need to be. It's actually simpler than it sounds. And now, here comes the bit that I love, the part beneath the surface. I'll enumerate it for you. One, Mulligan is a medical student. Two, he's about to go swimming. Three, he's feeling his ribs. Four, how many ribs do we have in the human body and what are their names? Well, here we go. I love this. The first seven pairs of your ribs are called the true ribs. The eighth, ninth, and tenth ribs are called the false ribs. And the eleventh and twelfth, the wait for it, are called the floating ribs. And he's standing beside the water. No comment needed. I'll be here again next week. Rejoice, episode 53, Horns and Hooves. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Let me first of all remind you, tomorrow, the 16th of June, is Bloomsday, the great feast of Joyce's Ulysses. And to commemorate it, I'll be putting up a special broadcast here, a summary of Chapter 1, to whose end we have now come. It has taken us one year, 52 weeks, and so now I'm going to read this week the last passage of Telemachus, the first chapter, and then we'll dive into the text. And you know where we are. The Joycean play on the word dive reminds you we're at the 40-foot bathing place just along the coast of South Dublin at Sandy Cove, down from the Martello Tower, where they've spent the night. And Buck Mulligan, watched by Stephen Dillis and Haynes the Englishman and some others whom he knows, is getting ready to swim. He's been talking to a young man whose legs Joyce has described as looking frog-like in the green jelly of the water. Now read on, and I quote, The young man shoved himself backward through the water and reached the middle of the creek in two long, clean strokes. Haynes sat down on a stone, smoking. "'Are you not coming in?' Buck Mulligan asked. Um, "'Later on,' Haynes said. "'Not on my breakfast.' Stephen turned away. "'I'm going, Mulligan,' he said. "'Give us that key, Kinch,' Buck Mulligan said, "'to keep my chemise flat.' Stephen handed him the key. Buck Mulligan laid it across his heaped clothes. "'And tuppence,' he said.' For a pint, throw it there. Stephen threw two pennies on the soft heap. Dressing, undressing. Buck Mulligan, erect, with joined hands before him, said solemnly, He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord, thus spake Zarathustra. His plump body plunged. We'll uh, see you again, Haines said, turning as Stephen walked up the path and smiling at wild Irish. Horn of a bull. Hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. The ship! Buck Mulligan cried. Half twelve! Good, Stephen said. He walked along the upward curving path. Liliata rutilantium, turma circumdet, jubilantium te virginium. The priest's grey nimbus in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here tonight. Home also I cannot go. A voice. Sweet-toned and sustained, called to him from the sea. Turning the curve, he waved his hand. It called again. A sleek brown head, a seal's, far out on the water, round. Usurper. End of quote. That's it. That's the end of the chapter, the first chapter. And in that quote, there's not a lot that needs unpacking, except that at the end, there is just a moment, a fragment of sheer brilliance. Here we go. Haynes demonstrates the old belief that you mustn't swim directly after a meal when he says he's not going in after his breakfast. Stephen throws down on Mulligan's clothes the heavy old key of the Martello Tower. Remember, there was a fracas in the tower during the night. I'll remind you of that tomorrow. And then Mulligan cadges the price of a drink from Stephen, and Mulligan again mocks the Catholic faith, and Joyce ties his mocking of religious faith to the non-faith ego-dependence of Zarathustra and Nietzsche. We had all of that last week. That connection makes the mockery interesting because, as with all of Mulligan's blasphemies, it's on a number of levels. When he says, He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord, Mulligan is actually subverting the book of Proverbs, chapter 19, verse 17, which in the King James Bible is, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. But he's also dissing Stephen as poor, even though he's borrowing from him. And Stephen is about to go and collect some pay from his teaching job. Hence the reference in the book of Proverbs, that which he hath given him, will he pay him again? Even though Mulligan doesn't overtly use it, he expects Stephen to know the reference. And now comes a line that once used to puzzle Joycean scholars, but it has a very simple explanation. In Stephen's thoughts, we hear the line, 
horn of a bull, hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. There are several versions of this. It's pretty old, and Joyce has a phrase missing. I recall it as a jingle. It's an old Irish proverb. Irish men will all beware the dog's loud bark and then take care of the bull's white horn, the horse's hoof, and the smile of an Englishman under your roof. I believe that it's a translation from the Gaelic, at least as Joyce uses it here, and I'm sad to say I don't know the original in the Gaelic. So, the scene is, Mulligan is in the water and shouts out a rendezvous with the ship, a pub, a tavern in centre of Dublin. Haynes says to Stephen pleasantly, see you later. Stephen recalls again Liliata Rutilantium, the prayers for the dying from his mother's funeral. He sees the old priest dressing in a haven of the rocks. Let me remind you of a couple of the sentences there. The priest's grey nimbus in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here tonight, home also I cannot go. As he, Stephen, vows not to stay in the Martello Tower again, but he can't go home either. And we're at the beginning of a long day's journey into night, 18 hours of it. And at the end, we'll discover where Stephen fetches up, drinking cocoa in the small hours of the morning. Now, I'm going to repeat piecemeal the last paragraph. You'll see why in a moment. A voice, sweet-toned and sustained, called to him from the sea. That's Mulligan in the water. Turning the curve, he waved his hand. That's Stephen, about to go out of sight of the forty-foot bathing place, and therefore waving a valedictory hand. It called again. That's Mulligan. A sleek brown head of seals far out on the water, round. That's Mulligan swimming. And there's one possibility I like here as to why Joyce used the word seal. Because in some folklore traditions around the coasts of Ireland, and more particularly Scotland, seals were supposed to be fallen angels, like Lucifer himself, who, for their bad deeds, and Mulligan has a few bad deeds to his name, were compelled to live as seals until Judgment Day. They also, of course, come into Homer's Odyssey, and we'll come to that in due time. And I now want to address that final word in Chapter 1, the word usurper. Not so much a stream of consciousness as a diamond dewdrop of consciousness, and it's the sheer brilliance to which I referred earlier. You see, this entire chapter has been wallpapered with references to Hamlet and is named after Telemachus, Odysseus' son. What were the two great struggles of those young men? Well, in Hamlet's case, he couldn't come to terms with how his uncle Claudius had usurped Hamlet's father's throne and wife, that's Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. In Telemachus's case, he, as the son of the wandering Odysseus, was dealing daily with those who came to his father's house, wooing Penelope, Odysseus's faithful and patient wife, and therefore they were would-be usurpers, not to mention Haynes the Englishman, who's English and therefore a usurper of Ireland's freedom. All that, a summary of the themes of chapter one in a single word, yes! And next week... We move on to chapter two. It's called Nestor. And don't forget Broomsday tomorrow and our celebratory edition, which will simply be a summary of chapter one, plus some extra sidelines on it. See you then. Rejoice, episode 53A, Happy Bloomsday. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Yes, it's the 16th of June, Bloomsday the great feast of James Joyce's Ulysses, the 107th anniversary this year of Thursday the 16th of June 1904, the day on which all the action, events, thoughts and occurrences take place in James Joyce's great novel, 18 hours in which we see the universe in the particular, the world in Dublin, the capital of Ireland. There's so much to say but let me begin by wishing everyone all over the world involved in celebrations this day the best of times. We're all friends in this great fun. And I'm taking today as a suitable opportunity to summarise chapter one of Ulysses, because last week I did the final podcast on the unpacking of the text from the opening chapter. Wasn't it neat and tidy that it took exactly one year to do Telemachus? Other chapters, believe you me, are much more complex and will take longer. So I'll just remind you of the action, if you can call it that, because there's not a lot of it. And I'll pass some comment on various details. And then I'll add some sidebars and stuff that I hope you'll find as interesting as I do. And let me thank you now, all of you who have commented on this podcast and who have been in touch with me one way and another about this great adventure. We're over 125 thousand downloads so far in one year. 
It's 8 o'clock in the morning south of Dublin in the suburb of Sandy Cove and Buck Mulligan, a medical student, prepares to shave on the parapet of the Martello Tower, the old fortification where he has spent the night with two friends, or rather one friend. Stephen Deedle is an artistic and literary but rather depressed young man, the autobiographical Joyce, and a passing stranger, so to speak, Haynes, an Englishman who is in love with all things native Irish. But Mulligan is a coarse blasphemer, and we're meant to see him like that. And he starts off by doing a parody of the Mass, the Catholic Mass, and then he sends for Stephen. There's a tiff going on between the two of them, because Mulligan has been callous and mocking about the recent death of Stephen's mother, which is the major tragedy in Stephen's young life so far. Mulligan rejects this criticism, and he carries on swaggering and blaspheming. Stephen's also had a bad night, because Haynes the Englishman has been having nightmares about a black panther and waking up everybody. There's a great deal of musing and looking out to sea and discussion of Irish art and gossip and inward reminiscence. And finally, Mulligan finishes shaving, goes back down into the tower, and Stephen continues to look out to sea and has fond memories of his dead mother and her girlish possessions. Then Mulligan calls him. Stephen goes down to a breakfast of bacon and egg and toast and tea, and an old woman comes with a can of milk, which she pours into their pitcher and for which they pay her. And when breakfast is over, they all leave the tower and they head down to a little local bathing place called the Forty Foot. It's still there. And Mulligan gets ready for a swim while Stephen and Haynes watch him. And then Stephen walks away. And that's it. The opening chapter, named Telemachus, after the son of Odysseus, the Greek wanderer, whom the Romans called Ulysses. Except that that isn't it. These are the pages where we first get wind of the depth of Joyce's intentions. Over the past year, 53 podcasts, I've unpacked dozens, if not hundreds, of references from the worlds of literature, religion, drama, philosophy, popular song, mysticism, education, history, emotional life, college life, theology, balladry, Ireland, the English monarchy, poetry, baudry, the theatre. A cornucopia of detail, much of it hidden beneath the surface, but hinted at by and ultimately informing the text around it. Joyce meant it to be a continuation of his own writing. If you make a calculation based on the dates of Bloomsday, today's date, the 16th of June 1904, and previously the final entry in Stephen Dedalus's diary, that appears in the work autobiographically declared Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, then you realise that only months separate Stephen's diary and the beginning of Ulysses, and that Joyce, in one sense, was writing a continuation of a portrait of the artist as a young man, a continuation of his own life. And it's his own life as a son of his father, as Hamlet is the son of his dead father, and as Telemachus is the son of his absent father. The connection? As we go on through Ulysses, we'll see that Stephen's view of his own father is of a man so reckless and feckless and useless that he might as well be dead because he's absent, absent from all familial responsibility. This, after all, is based on a man who, according to the Joyce family lore, had to cut down the banisters of the staircase in their home to keep the fire lighting in winter. And that father-son thing, that's the novel's journey, the young man lost in the world looking for a father figure. And it's God the Father and God the Son too, the Christ crucified, whose crucifixion in Stephen's case is at the hands of Mulligan's blasphemous mockery. And Stephen's also looking for a home because he can't fit in at the Martello Tower. He's between church and state. Mulligan mocking the church and Haynes, the Englishman, whose people are, after all, then the political state of Ireland. Do you recall my saying that Joyce was a highly political writer? Well, He's writing to about Ireland that doesn't have its own father, its own head of state. And Joyce told his friends that this opening chapter was the story of a dispossessed young man's struggle setting forth on the world. Dispossessed. It's a political word. Now, there's so much more I could say. I could be here for several hours yet. But it is Bloomsday, and I have celebrating to do. And then next Wednesday, we begin chapter two, which is called Nestor. And once more, wherever you are today, happy Bloomsday. Rejoice, episode 54, Who is Nestor? Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Now we move into year two, though I can't promise to get through every chapter in exactly one year, as we did with chapter one. 
There will be some that will take two years at least. We know where we are now, though, and where we've been. Stephen Didilus, the autobiographical James Joyce, has left his mocking, undermining friend Buck Mulligan, taking a morning swim, watched by the passing stranger Haynes the Englishman, and Stephen, morose and lonely, is on his way to the private school where he teaches in the nearby suburb of Dorky to collect some wages that have been due to him. Since we know that Joyce had each chapter of Ulysses correspond to a chapter in Homer's Odyssey, and this is named Nestor, who or what was Nestor, and how does this parallel work? Well... First of all, Nestor, in Book Two of Homer's Odyssey, is a wise man with an excellent past. He was a warrior, he was a charioteer, and he was a man to whom younger men turned for advice, as did Telemachus, Odysseus' son, and found Nestor surrounded by his own sons. In Chapter Two of Ulysses, Nestor is Mr. Deci, a teacher, surrounded by schoolboys to whom Stephen will give one last lesson, and we meet Mr. Deci not this week, but over the next weeks you'll find him. Here's the beginning of the chapter. It opens with Stephen teaching. Uh, you, Cochrane, what city is sent for him? Tarentum, sir. Very good. Well, there was a battle, sir. Very good. Where? The boy's blank face asked the blank window, fabled by the daughters of memory. And yet it was in some way, if not as memory fabled it, a phrase then of impatience, thud, of Blake's wings of excess. I hear the ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppling masonry, and time one livid final flame. What's left us then? End of quotation. Right, here we go. This is what's happening, and it's not a lot on the surface anyway. But beneath the surface, well, as ever with Joyce, that's a different matter. It's now ten o'clock in the morning on the 16th of June, 1904. This is a lesson in Roman history, which used to be a subject separate from ordinary history when I was in school. It was part of the Latin language course. Cochrane is the name of one of the boys attending the school where Stephen teaches, and here's an interesting detail. When he was planning the writing of Ulysses, Joyce acquired minute detail of Dublin and its residents. For the inner city, he used street directories, and we'll come to those, I assure you. There were books with every name and address on every street. Here, though, the location is a fairly posh southern suburb of Dublin named Dorky, and the boy Cochrane, whom Stephen addresses in the opening sentence, could have been living there. In 1904, there was a family named Cochrane registered with an address in Dorky, so one of Joyce's tenets always was to anchor fiction to real life. Now, who was the him sent for by the city of Tarentum? That was King Pyrrhus, from whom we get the term Pyrrhic victory, which is winning, but at great cost. Pyrrhus was a kind of king for hire, a warrior who took on the mighty Romans on behalf of weaker states and cities, and had some success against them, including at the Battle of Asculum in 279 BC, which is the place whose name the boy can't remember, although he does get the date right. Do you remember that rhyme? In heaven there'll be no algebra, remembering dates and names, but only playing golden harps and reading Henry James. Sorry, digression. Couldn't resist it. <laughs> Now, while the boy is struggling blank-faced, looking out the window, trying to remember the name of Asculum, Stephen's mind wanders. We read his thoughts, and as they will be so often throughout the novel, they seem at first glance tangential, oblique, opaque, and mysterious. But the connections will surface as we unravel the references, and you could call that one of the general principles by which Joyce wrote here, I'll repeat it for you, is Stephen's first thought. It's in two sentences. Fabled by the daughters of memory, and yet it was in some way, if not as memory, fabled it. Now, who are the daughters of memory, and what is the fable here? This, I can tell you, is wonderful stuff. The great god Zeus had nine daughters, the nine muses. Their disciplines, astronomy, comedy, dance, epic poetry, History, hymns to the gods, love poetry, music, and tragedy. Their names, you recognize some of them at least. Urania, Thalia, Terpsichore or Terpsichore, Calliope, she was epic poetry. Cleo, Polyhymna, for hymns, that makes sense. Erato, Euterpe, and who was tragedy? Melpomene. But why are they called the daughters of memory? Well, their mother was the goddess 
Nemesign. Did you ever use a mnemonic to remember something? That's where the word comes from. Nemosyne. I'll spell it for you. M-N-E-M-O-S-Y-N-E. -E. She was the goddess of memory, and mnemonic is spelled M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C. I love it. Well, what's going on here? Here's the quote again. And yet it was in some way, if not as memory fabled it. That's the next sentence. So, as ever with Joyce, let's look for clues in the surrounding text here in what follows. This is the next sentence. Here are the next two sentences. A phrase, then, of impatience, thud of Blake's wings of excess. I hear the ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppling masonry, and time one livid final flame. What's left us then? In other words, if the world ends like this, what will we have gained? Will we have triumphed but lost, like King Pyrrhus? Was it his phrase of impatience? And we'll come to that in next week. Or Blake's? Or both? This now you're seeing here, James Joyce heading towards his most complex, and at the same time doing something really brilliant. He's showing how the human brain skips from one related thing to another related thing, the electrons firing, or whatever it is that fires in the brain, the synapses, I suppose. Blake, the Blake mentioned, is that wondrous figure, William Blake, the English 18th century poet, visionary, and mystic. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. That's Blake, as is tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. And Blake, of course, wrote the words to the hymn Jerusalem. Blake, great painter, great poet, radical subversive, charged with treason, the advocate of free love and gay rights, who liked to sit naked in his garden with his wife, shocking his visitors. Blake was a towering figure, whose reputation is still growing. And here, Stephen fuses three pieces of Blake's work. The first was published in, I think it was 1810, and was called A Vision of the Last Judgment. And in that work, Blake seems to consider that all events, once they have happened, listen to this, that all events, once they have happened, although we may call them history, nonetheless become fiction, a fable. In a work that he called The Last Judgment, this is what he said, and it's this to which Joyce is alluding. Quote, The last judgment is not fable or allegory, but vision. Fable or allegory are a totally distinct and inferior kind of poetry. Vision or imagination is a representation of what eternally exists, really and unchangeably. Fable or allegory is formed by the daughters of memory. The Last Judgment is one of these stupendous visions. I have represented it, Blake said, as I saw it. And that... There you have it in a nutshell. That's Blake and his visions. And all of that is running through Stephen Dedalus's mind. And he attaches it in his mind, as the brain does, as the brain makes these lightning connections to two more famous Blake phrases. Here's the first one. No bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings, said Blake. And the second one. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. And I'll drink to both of those. And as for the shattered glass and toppling masonry and time one livid final flame, well, here, Stephen is connecting Blake's vision to the fall of cities. Was it the end of the world for Tarentum when King Pyrrhus won but last? And even an amateur psychologist knows that depressed people think of doom and gloom and cataclysm and the world as they know it coming to an end. And Stephen is surely one depressed young man, still mourning his beloved dead mother. He has nowhere to live, and already, as we've seen, he has been put down multiple times by his false, jibing friend, Buck Mulligan. Now you begin to smell something. You begin to smell the rubber hitting the road. Now you can sense what complications lie ahead of us. Chapter one was relatively simple. Stay with me, though. Be here again next week, and we continue to have, I hope, great enjoyment. Rejoice, episode 55, Making the Point of a Spear. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. We're now in chapter two of Ulysses, a chapter which goes by the name of Nestor. Stephen is teaching Roman history to a class of boys. He has asked a boy for the details of a battle fought by King Pyrrhus, he of the Pyrrhic victories against the Romans. Here's the text as the boy attempts to answer Stephen's question, where was the battle? And now I quote. I forget the place, sir. 279 B.C. Ask you them, Stephen said, dancing at the name and date in the Gorse card book. Yes, sir. 
And he said, another victory like that and we're done for. That phrase the world had remembered, a dull ease of the mind. From a hill above a corpse-strewn plain, a general speaking to his officers leaned upon his spear. Any general to any officers, they lend ear. End of quote. Let's get at it. The Battle of Asculum in 279 BC, that's clear enough. Romans routed by Pyrrhus the king, who lost a lot of troops in the effort, and is said to have said that if he won another such victory, he would face ruin. Hence the phrase, a Pyrrhic victory, now in such commonplace, everyday use that we don't even use the uppercase P for Pyrrhic when it's an adjective. Then there are Stephen's thoughts, which we get between his questions and the boy's answers. You caught the word Gorskard, the name and date in the Gorskard book. Well, Joyce has got it down in the text as one word, no hyphen, nothing, but it's a composite of the two words gore and scarred. Scarred, you know, but gore. <laughs> gore means dirty, and the dirt comes originally from blood, blood and gore. And specifically, or you can read this into it, the blood that comes from being gored or pierced. Now, it also means a triangle of land, and the triangle shape comes from something that can gore you. In this case, the triangular tip of a spear. Now, what do we find a moment later in the next thought? From a hill above a corpse-strewn plain, a general, speaking to his officers, leaned upon his spear. That's Joyce for you, the delayed echo, so effective. First we get the word gore, and then we get the word that refers to it in more than one way, the word spear. It's a technique that makes us readers retain the text. The rest of that paragraph is plain enough. Another victory like that and we're done for, the boy says. That is the colloquial paraphrasing of the famous remark that King Pyrrhus made after he won. History reports it as Pyrrhus saying to his officers, One more such victory will undo me. That's why Stephen observes that phrase the world had remembered. Now here's a little treat. Did you catch that phrase, a dull ease of the mind? It's just hanging there. An unconnected thought? Nope. No way, Jose. Always, always in Joyce. Watch out for something dangling like that because it can have a little gem, a little bright bauble attached to it. And in fact, may I make two comments here? In Joyce, there's no such thing as an unconnected thought. I may prove myself wrong about that over the years, but we'll see. And secondly, if I make an error or have already made an error in this exercise of deconstruction and decoding, it's most likely to be an error of omission. I may miss references, hidden in phrases and even words, because they seem so innocent and vehicular, just carrying the story along. I don't think I've missed any, by the way, but from now on, I'm going to be super vigilant. Therefore, let's look at that little sentence, a dull ease of the mind. What's he up to? I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I put it away, and not being able to sleep last night, it suddenly bothered me. What is he up to? Ha! And then I got it. He's quoting the blind poet John Milton who crops up again and again. He's here a few pages later in this piece. In fact, a few paragraphs later. In 1644, Milton wrote a famous article attacking government censorship, arguing sarcastically that people will just lapse into fun and games if they allow others to control what they ingest and therefore control what they think about. Stephen recalls that as he's watching the boys struggle with remembering dates and names in Roman history and listen to the echoes now in Joyce's mind because here's Milton's actual quotation. He says, What need they torture their heads with that which others have taken so strictly and so unalterably into their own purveying? These are the fruits which a dull ease and cessation of our knowledge will bring forth among the people. Ha! Ah, a dull ease. Ease. And speaking of echoes, now Stephen will, in his own and Milton's terms, go on torturing the boys and making sure that they learn enough to do their own thinking, because the lesson in Roman history continues, and we'll be with it again next week. Just a final note to remind you this week. This chapter, as I said, is known as Nestor, and let me do something that I want to keep on doing. 
Let me remind you of Homer's Nestor. He's in Book 3 of the Odyssey. He welcomes Telemachus, the Stephen figure, to his house. He gives him help and advice. He kills a heifer and cooks it so that Stephen will have a feast. And here's the quote from Homer. They cut out the thigh bones, all in due course, wrap them round in two layers of fat, and set some pieces of raw meat on the top of them. Then Nestor laid them upon the wood fire and poured wine over them. End of quote. What, therefore, will prove to be the meat which Joyce's Nestor, a teacher called Mr. D.C., gives Joyce's Telemachus, Stephen Dedalus? Well, join me here next week and the next weeks after that for more of James Joyce's version of Homer's Odyssey. Rejoice, episode 56, The Cookie Crumbles. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. We're in chapter two of Ulysses, a chapter which goes by the name of Nestor. Stephen is teaching Roman history to a class of boys. He's asked one boy for the details of a battle fought by King Pyrrhus, he of the Pyrrhic victories against the Romans, three centuries BC. Here's the next piece of text as the boy attempts to answer Stephen's question. Uh, you, Armstrong, Stephen said. What was the end of Pyrrhus? End of Pyrrhus, sir? I know, sir. Ask me, sir, Common said. Wait. You, Armstrong, do you know anything about Pyrrhus? A bag of fig rolls lay snugly in Armstrong's satchel. He curled them between his palms at whiles and swallowed them softly. Crumbs adhered to the tissue of his lips. A sweetened boy's breath. Well-off people, proud that their eldest son was in the Navy. Vico Road, Dorky. End of quote. Fairly straightforward, isn't it? Well, let's see. Stephen asks what happened to King Pyrrhus. The boy he asks, Armstrong, doesn't know. Another boy, name of Common, butts in. Common spelled, by the way, C-O-M-Y-N. Stephen holds him off, waiting for the clearly unknowing Armstrong to offer an answer. But Armstrong's interests are elsewhere. Armstrong is a secret eater of fig rolls, and I would be too if I were Armstrong. Fig rolls are biscuits in Ireland and Britain, cookies elsewhere, and they are yumsville. Yum, yum, yum. They were made by a famous Dublin company, W&R Jacob, who also made Mikado and Kimberley and coconut creams, the best of the lot, in my humble opinion, and Marietta and Jacob's cream crackers and gold grain, terrific with cheese, and afternoon tea assorted, and you could get those in a large box as well as in a nifty packet, though they weren't as good, I think, as USA assorted, which you could get in a bigger box, and they had... Well, okay, that's enough. Okay, I'm getting carried away. Anyway... Armstrong is sneakily eating fig rolls. First, you have the descriptive narrative. He curled them between his palms at whiles and swallowed them softly. Crumbs adhered to the tissue of his lips. So, there's the third-person description. And then you have the interior monologue of Stephen's thoughts. A sweetened boy's breath. Well-off people, proud that their eldest son was in the Navy. Vico Road Dorky. There's a couple of things to watch out for here. With any worthwhile author, keep an eye on the names of characters. Charles Dickens, I think, is one of the best examples of making a character's name do extra work in characterization. Scrooge sounds mean and cheap, doesn't it? Mr. Grimwig, who is exactly that? And what about the old thief in Nicholas Dickleby, Peg Sliderskew? Joyce, so far in this chapter, has given us the names of just three boys, Cochrane, Armstrong and Common. Now, what's he up to? First of all, and you'd have to know Dublin culture to know this, each of those names is Protestant. Cochrane and Common are Scots names. Armstrong is English. Well, you can easily imagine why Joyce included the name Armstrong when discussing military matters. Pyrrhus strong-armed his Roman opponents into defeat. But Cochrane and Common Joyce was known to have a near-demonic interest in people's names, and this is fascinating. You'd find Cochrane in different forms. One is Irish, and it comes from an old, old name, Cochrane, and it derives from an old Gaelic word for purple, curricula. There's also a derivation there of a Welsh word for the colour red. So here you have a name when discussing King Pyrrhus versus the Romans, whose emperors were purple and spilled a lot of red blood. And last week, in the preceding paragraphs, we had gore, as in blood and gore. Cochrane, Armstrong, and Common in that order. Well, what about Common? I really like this. 
The most renowned member of that old and once powerful Scottish family who fought the English and most associated with the name Common was a gentleman named of, wait for it, Red Common. But look for something else. There's a line coming up, proud that their eldest son was in the Navy. Well, in Joyce's consciousness in Ireland in the late 19th century, the great naval hero from history would have been Lord Nelson, and his beloved and quite famous chaplain was named Stephen George Common. And, and if you accept too that the Irish family name Cummins is related to the Scots name Cummins, well, how about this? Later in Ulysses, in the famous Citizen chapter, and we'll come to it, there's mention of a Cummins on Francis Street, Dublin. And what was this Cummins? A pawnbroker. And you can be sure, therefore, well known to the Joyce family. Now, what about the phrases, a sweetened boy's breath and Vico Road Dokey? Anything there? Well, yes, as it happens. Let's park, let's bookmark a sweetened boy's breath until next week. And its relevance will be plain. Don't worry, I'll hark back to it fully. Vico Road, though, is interesting and it's disputed. On one level, it's easy peasy. Vico Road was a nearby rather lovely and then, as now, well-to-do suburb of Dublin near the school where Stephen is teaching, which is also, by the way, where Joyce also taught in real life for a very short time. And second level, there was a 17th century Italian philosopher, Gian Battista Vico. And this is this week's knockout punch. This is why I get so damned excited about this book. First of all, it's not only legitimate that Joyce has these boys coming from such a suburb as the Vico Road. It's appropriate. They would have done had they been real boys at that school. And there were boys from the Vico Road area at the school on which it is modelled. But Joyce would have been more than pleased to use the name Vico in his text because he liked and studied closely the works of the man whom he called the round-headed Neapolitan Jean Battista Vico. What did he like? Two things. He liked that... Vico believed that imagination is memory. Imagination is memory. It's a big idea. Get hold of it. That we process and alter in the workings, in the process, the things we recall. Now, you see how that would have appealed to a man who wrote a novel based almost entirely on his memory of his native city? He wrote every word of Ulysses in exile. You get it? Secondly, <laughs> the Vico road runs around in a kind of circle. And Jean Battista Vico believed and propounded that all history is recurrent, that mankind lives within a large circle of governance. First, he said, we have theocratic control, then aristocratic, then democratic, then it all collapses and we start all over again. That whole circularity and Joyce's use of Vico, as it relates to a road and as it relates to a philosopher, that's a first-rate capsule example of why I call these little podcasts Rejoice. Rejoice, episode 57, A Touch of Class. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. We're in chapter two of Ulysses, a chapter which goes by the name of Nestor. This is the part where Stephen has been teaching a class of Roman history. And there was a school in Dorky, a suburb just south of Sandico, where the book begins. It was called the Clifton School, set in a property called Summerfield Lodge. And Joyce was there briefly in the spring of 1904. The temporary teaching job that he applied for was advertised as a position for a gentleman usher. <laughs> now here Stephen has asked a boy named of Armstrong if he knows anything about Pyrrhus, the king who took on the Roman Empire. Armstrong is much more interested in eating the biscuits, the cookies, in his school satchel, and clearly knows very little about King Pyrrhus. Here's the quote, and there's a nice literary image coming up. Pyrrhus, sir, a pear. All laughed, mirthless, high, malicious laughter. Armstrong looked round at his colleagues, silly glee in profile. In a moment, they will laugh more loudly, aware of my lack of rule and of the fees their papas pay. Uh, tell me now, Stephen said, poking the boy's shoulder with the book. What is a pear? A pear, sir, Armstrong said. A thing out in the water, a kind of a bridge. Kingstown pier, sir. Some laughed again, mirthless, but with meaning. Two in the back bench whispered. Yes, they knew. Had never learned, nor ever been innocent. All. With envy he watched their faces. Edith, Ethel, Gertie, Lily. Their likes. 
Their brats, too, sweetened with tea and jam, their bracelets tittering in the struggle. End of quotation. Okay, let's have a go at this. <clears throat> Armstrong thinks that the word pyrrhus is Latin or Greek or something for a pier. And, of course, there's a famous pier in the sea nearby at Kingstown, what is now called Dunleary. By the way, the pier has two arms at Dunleary. They come around the harbour like crab claws, not quite meeting, so the shipping can get in and out. And there's a local legend that the architect or the engineer or the builder, when the piers were finished, measured them and found that the east pier was a foot and a half short, or long, or whatever, of the west pier. Since they were supposed to be identical, he took his life, jumped in the sea. A pyrrhic victory if you like. You never know with Joyce. Watch the text, though, because here you have again this thing that Joyce does so interestingly. He switches from what you might call standard third-person narration to the interior monologue that Joyce made famous and that made Joyce famous, the technique whereby we hear the character's unspoken thoughts. I'll repeat the sentences for you. All laughed, mirthless, high, malicious laughter. Armstrong looked round at his classmates, silly glee in profile. Well, that's the third person, and here is Stephen's musing. In a moment they will laugh more loudly, aware of my lack of rule and of the fees their papas pay. Well, apart from that switch of technique, there's nothing of multi-level interest there. So, next phrases. Tell me now, Stephen said, poking the boy's shoulder with a book. What is a pier? A pier, sir, Armstrong said. A thing out in the water, a kind of a bridge. Kingstown Pier, sir. Well, I've repeated it, but it's straight enough, I think. Let me look. I like very much the way we see Stephen poking the boy's shoulder with a book. We actually see it, if you know what I mean. And we have Armstrong characterised as the class clown looking around in glee, pressing on with his idea of King Pyrrhus as a pier. The same Kingstown Pier that we had earlier, Dunleary Pier. And now comes the sticky bit, the interesting bit. Some laughed again, says the text, mirthless but with meaning. Two in the back bench whispered. Well, that is, if you look at it, third party narration, isn't it? Two in the back bench whispered. Yes. Well, here comes Stephen's thoughts again. Yes, he thinks. They knew. Had never learned, nor ever been innocent. All. With envy he watched their faces. Edith, Ethel, Gertie, Lily. Their likes. Their brats, too, sweetened with tea and jam, their bracelets tittering in the struggle. Hmm. Let's try <clears throat> and unravel those sentences. What is Joyce doing here? Well, he is looking at these Protestant boys, and he's assuming that not only do they know about Pyrrhus, they know other things, too. Here's the sociological terrain into which we've ambled, and it is fascinating. Take the two words, they knew, Take the word innocent, which they've never been. Take the word all. And then take the four names of the girls. Stephen, remember, is described as watching the boys' faces with envy. So what's he envying? He's envying the fact that these boys are already sexually experienced, and he's not. And the sociological reason for this? He's a Catholic, and it's a sin, sex before marriage, more crucially, he, being a Catholic, doesn't have access to and isn't allowed to use contraception, whereas the Protestants can, it's not against their religion. So, Protestant girls, when I was growing up, and certainly when Joyce was growing up, it's true too, were always more desirable because they were always more relaxed about sex because they didn't fear getting pregnant, because they took what used to be called precautions, whereas Catholic girls took high risks, and if they were unlucky, had their lives ruined. How do we know all this in Ulysses? This is how we know. You look at the girls' names. Edith, Ethel, Gertie, Lily, and he says, their likes. First of all, by and large, no Catholic girl would have those names. They'd be Bridget or Mary. By the way, Edith is Edie Boardman and Gertie is Gertie McDowell, and I say that because you'll meet them here again several years from now in a separate chapter, and you'll be seeing them through the eyes of Mr. Leop Leopold Bloom, whom you yet have to meet. I love, I love Mr. Bloom. He he's adorable. Do you to meet him? Lily. Lily's interesting. Lily's Lily Carlisle. Remember her? Now, she's a name that you've just heard because Stephen has just heard it being trotted out to Mulligan at the 40-foot 
The red-haired girl, remember? We heard about her in, let me think, it was this episode 52, yes. Do you remember a chap named of Seymour, an acquaintance of Buck Mulligan, was spooning with this red-haired girl, Lily Carlisle, last night on, ha, where? Kingstown Pier. So there you have the train of thought. So that's Lily, Gertie, and Edie accounted for. And Ethel, the fourth name? Well, see it as a name that Joyce just pulls out as being a typical Protestant girl's name, because there's no Ethel mentioned anywhere else in Ulysses. Not at all. And not only that, there's a little class dig in here as well, because of all of these boys, not one of them doesn't come from an upper-class or upper-middle-class family. But the girls, to judge from their names, are from lower down the scale. You know it from their names. And you'll certainly know it when you meet Gertie and Edie later on. And, unfortunately, that's the last we hear of red-haired Lily Carlyle. A pity I rather like the sound of her. So, this segment, this, these, this paragraph, it's a little bit about class. And in a classroom, <laughs> that's very joyous. Finally, if you remember last week, we had that sentence about a sweetened boy's breath. And it's Armstrong who has been eating fig rolls. Stephen's musing on him, a sweetened boy's breath. Well, here's this from this week. You heard it earlier. Their breaths, too, sweetened with tea and jam because they could afford to have sweeter breaths than the largely poorer Catholics. And here's a terrific line about the grapplings of young love. Their bracelets tittering in the struggle. Can't you just hear it? Love it. Rejoice, episode 58, A Disappointed Bridge. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. We're in chapter two of Ulysses, a chapter that goes by the name of Nestor. We still haven't met Joyce's version of Homer's, but we will. We're still in the classroom with Stephen teaching, as indeed Joyce himself did, in the spring of 1904, some months before the single day's events of Ulysses. He has just asked one of the boys, Armstrong, who or what was King Pyrrhus, and the best answer that Armstrong can offer is, Pyrrhus, sir, Pyrrhus, appear. After some distracting thoughts about the sex that these boys might be having with different girls, we had that last week in episode 57, Stephen returns to the lesson in hand. Here we go. I'll read this week's chunk in its entirety, and then we'll deconstruct it line by line. Kingstown Pier, Stephen said. Yes, a disappointed bridge. The words troubled their gaze. How, sir? Common asked. A bridge is across a river. For Haynes's chapbook. No one here to hear. Tonight, uh, deftly amid wild drink and talk, to pierce the polished mail of his mind. What then? A jester at the court of his master, indulged and disesteemed, winning a clement master's praise. Why had they chosen all that part, not wholly for the smooth caress? For them, too, history was a tale like any other too often heard, their land upon shop. End of quote. Now, in earnest, we're getting into the driving principle of how Ulysses was written. The premise is this. Stephen, being Joyce's own autobiographical avatar in reverse, so to speak, an avatar is a human manifestation of an immaterial figure such as a god, Stephen has a richly stocked mind, and when he's deep in thought, anything can be dredged up, and it can have direct or oblique relevance, and it's the oblique stuff that has caused Ulysses to be abandoned as too difficult. As you'll see later on in this great adventure of ours, when Mr. Bloom is deep in thought, anything can be dredged up too, and he's often obscure also, though obviously less erudite or replete with classical references than Stephen is. But then Mr. Bloom hasn't been to university, and he wasn't educated by the Jesuits. So, first of all here, we have Stephen's rather nice joke, which the boys don't get. Kingstown Pier, Stephen said. Yes, a disappointed bridge. The words troubled their gaze. They really don't get it, do they? How, sir? Common asked. A bridge is across a river. See? Didn't get it at all. The rest of the segment, then, is entirely composed of Stephen's thoughts, and it's these that we need to decode. First obstacle. For Haynes's chapbook, he thinks, no one here to hear. Tonight, deftly, amid wild drink and talk, to pierce the polished mail of his mind. Remember Haynes, the Englishman? Of course you do. Whom we last saw watching Mulligan swim at the 40 foot at the end of chapter one. Well, Haynes is in Ireland collecting, essentially, things Irish. 
is passionate about things Irish. He wants to be a major collector of things Irish, folklore, tradition, songs, music. And Mulligan has already told Stephen that he, Stephen, should sell his bon mots, his brilliant remarks, to Haynes for a guinea each. Well, Stephen is now musing that perhaps tonight, because there's nobody there in the school to appreciate his wit, he will indeed sell that remark, that good joke, about a pair being a disappointed bridge to Haynes to put in his book, the book he may write, his notebook, whatever, his chapbook. Let's nail chapbook here, because the word stands out, and whenever that happens, I've said this over and over, go for it. A chapbook was a slang name for a book because one of the first mass-market publishers, book publishers in England, was named Chapman. Not, of course, to be confused with the Chapman of John Keats's poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer. That was the Elizabethan translator of Homer. But since this is Ulysses, and therefore so intensely aware of Homer, Joyce managed to get part of the name Chapman in here. And by the way, the word chap, as in chapbook, comes originally from the German word cheap, and it meant a trader or a customer in commerce. So there you are, chaps. Have a good time, chaps, is what an Englishman would say. So Haynes the Englishman, chap as in chapbook, all ties together. Next line. Tonight, deftly, amid wild drink and talk, to pierce the polished mail of his mind. They'll meet in a pub and there will be wild talk, and Steve will land a blow. As in a joust, Haynes will be wearing the polished armour of the superior Englishman. But however smooth and traditional this English chain mail will be, the Irishman's wit will pierce it. Next line, though, betrays the futility. Stephen thinks, what then? A jester at the court of his master, indulged and disesteemed, winning a clement master's praise. In other words, the Irishman's role, should he prove wittier, and therefore intellectually superior to the Englishman, is reduced to that of court jester. And this is interesting. It was so long the case, and I saw it happen to people myself, that when the English, who were superior militarily and thus politically, wanted to bring the clever Irish under control, they turned them in to court jesters, made them out to be so entertaining, disesteemed them. Joyce believed that they did it, for instance, to Oscar Wilde. Oh, you are Irish, you're so entertaining, tell us a joke. So Stephen is wary that Haynes will do the same to him and thereby patronise him and thereby reduce him. And he goes on to muse on the Irish who allowed the English to do that to them. Why had they chosen all that part, is Stephen's mused question. The answer, not wholly for the smooth caress, in other words, not entirely just to make things easy. Or another way of putting it, was it a rougher weapon in an Irishman's hands than mere social oil, this wit? Well... Here's the political knife going in. It goes in so easily you don't feel it. Here we go. For them, too, history was a tale like any other. Too often heard, their land, a pawn shop. A pawn shop. Remember we had the name Common, a boy called Common? There was a pawn shop, it's mentioned in Ulysses, I said that last week, owned by Cummins. But here's the reference again to history being a recurrent pattern. After Jean-Baptiste Vico, the... Italian philosopher we mentioned last week, of whom Joyce was so fond. And the blade is in the word pawn shop, which refers to both England and Ireland as places where there is nothing original, nothing new. Everything has been, as the current R phrase goes, has been previously enjoyed, second hand. The syndrome that Joyce, that most original of minds, loathed and feared, second hand thought, second hand ideas. And from all that existed. He quarried his own highly original material. Talk about making gold from dross. That's Ulysses, as you will see. You probably have already seen it. Oh, and by the way, as for Kingstown Pier being a disappointed bridge, it was, and Dunleary still is, the major point of embarkation for England from Ireland. But as a pier, the mail boat ties up to a pier. The boat you get to go to England, you step on the pier and you step onto the boat. So, as a bridge, well, it didn't reach far enough to bridge the gap between the two countries. <laughs>